Welcome everyone, I'm George Mayer, the Director of Sales at Watchbox, and we have a unique conversation set up for you today where we have longtime friend and collector Todd Searle, along with H. Moser brand CEO Edward Maylon. The three of us are here today to discuss the rise of independent watchmakings and the latest happenings with up-and-coming brand H. Moser. Todd, Ed, thanks for coming on. Thanks for having us, George. Thank you for really having excited us. to be here. So I think Same we should here. start off with a risk check, as we normally do on uh, most Watchbox uh, conversations. So I am wearing the uh, Venturer Small Seconds, 39 millimeter white gold, the sky blue Fume dial, signature uh, uh, feature of, of most. Uh, exhibition case back, 72 hour power reserve, hacking seconds. I'm really, really digging this. I even... Uh, organized my outfit around it today. So I'm, I'm loving it. What are you guys wearing? Love it. Uh, George and uh, Edward, in the spirit of your recent collaboration with MBNF, uh, I am wearing the MBNF HM7 uh, Aquapod. Um, love this watch uh, in titanium, super lightweight, disappears on the wrist, uh, all the hallmarks of MBNF and uh, Loved what you guys did with uh, MBNF in your collaboration. I think you guys really just uh, knocked it out of the park and uh, brought even more attention to the H. Moser brand. So congratulations on that. Thank you, Todd. Uh, beautiful watch and great brand. Uh, I'm obviously wearing a H. Moser uh, Streamliner. Um, I'm just showing you the bag because I reveal the front afterwards. That's uh, something we are we're launching tomorrow. Actually, it's probably... Uh, it will be launched by the time we release this, but uh, let's keep the surprise for later in the, in the discussion. Very exciting. So we at Watchbox have seen more interest than ever in, uh, of late in independent watch brands. And I drivers as to why that's the case. Uh, Todd, I'm very interested in hearing your thoughts about why independent brands have gotten so much recent traction. And Ed, I would love to hear from you uh, what it is like being both financially and intellectually independent as a watch brand. So uh, let me hear your, your thoughts uh, on that. Freedom is, um, is, uh, is a luxury in a way. I mean, I had the chance to be able to own and run uh, H. Moser, an independent family-owned brand. It's, it's, it's our family. And uh, I think it's... Um, I mean, obviously, there's there's two sides of it. There's one great side is you can do you can do whatever you want. You can be creative, you can be polarizing, you can be sometimes um, um, going after uh, certain ideas that might not be uh, cool or trying to uh, poke at uh, at certain bigger brands and 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 criticize things you think are not um, the right way. You can go a little bit after the establishment. And on the other side, well, uh, you are alone. So you need to make sure that uh, when you're independent, your business works on its own and uh, it's self-sustainable and not only for a year, but for many years. So you need constantly to uh, to manage, you know, to keep in mind your, your, your cash flow, your uh, your long-term plan and uh, and not just the, the quarterly quarterly results. You're really looking, you know, for the next five years. You need a really a plan of products and what's next. And sometimes, I mean, it scares me. I'm like, oh my God, what are we going to launch in 2022 or 2023? Because it takes so long to develop something. Well, we have great people and we always find solutions. But uh, yeah, you're on your own, so you need um, you need to be careful and keep that in mind. Yeah, and to uh, to play off of that a little bit, I'm I'm one of the reasons I'm really drawn towards H Moser and what you guys do is, um, you know, instead of having to be responsible for quarterly results, you guys are always looking at ways to really push the envelope. And I think you guys do such a great job of having, you know, kind of what we've coined as um, a defiant respect for the tradition of watchmaking. Um, and and I think H Moser is so interesting to me in two different ways. It's in, the, in, in one way, it's what you've done to sort of protect Swiss watchmaking. But I think on the other hand, what's, what's so interesting to me and cool to me about what you do at H. Moser is you really just push the boundaries of not only mechanical excellence in timepieces, you push the boundaries of designs, you're pushing the boundaries of what dials would be considered normal by any collector. Uh, and I love the fact that you are continuously seeking, developing new materials, developing new colors, uh, for your dials and really just pushing the envelope of, of what a watch is. And I think in the watch world, so many people have followed the mainstream brands. I think 
um, as a collector, I came to, to into watches, gravitated towards the mainstream brands. And then I got really sick of people saying the word innovation uh, and basically putting out a new dial configuration or putting a watch case in a new metal and a new dial and calling it innovation. And I got really tired of that. Uh, and so I really have gravitated towards independent watchmaking for this persistent innovation, uh, continuous improvements, whether that's in materials or in new patents, new ways to take a 200 year old complication and improve it. Um, and I think you guys do an incredible job of that. I think you're, yeah, you, you're, you're right. I think you're, one, one element I'd, I'd like to add is that maybe the way we think as independents, um, you, you were referring to MBNF and I think it's, it's in many ways very similar. I remember a few years back where we were discussing with a big, big brands and they were telling us how very strong they were in data management and knowing exactly what customers' next expectations are and they do a lot of consumer research, et cetera. And, and I had agency contacting me and say, oh, you know, if you need consumer research, if you need to uh, anticipate the next trend, then we can give you the data and the information. And my reaction was extremely pretentious, to be honest. But I told them, I don't want to know what people are expecting next. I want to surprise them. I want to create trends. And I think that's what small independent brands like ours are there for. That's the only way we can really stand out is, is try to surprise people, um, create something that nobody expects. And then being trendsetters. If you look at the market today, you see free made ads everywhere. And so it's, it can be for us very frustrating because we've been building our brand around those beautiful dyes for years. But at the same time, it shows that 10 years ago, when I started with those, playing with the dyes that was even looking at, we were anticipating, we created a trend that everybody is following today. And, and we are constantly looking for the next thing. And I think that's, uh, that's the chance that we have is, uh, we, we don't want to be the prêt-à-porter. We want to be the haute couture and the haute couture is, you know, the segment that creates those trends. You guys really put this on a tee for me because Todd, you were talking about how you're looking for something, you know, new things that aren't mainstream. And uh, Ed, you said, you know, we want to stand out. A quote of yours that uh, I read last night was, you cannot be mainstream if you want to stand out. And uh, I think you guys are always looking to do, you know, cool, new, different, innovative things. Um, I don't know of anyone else that has made a uh, watch case out of cheese uh, before you guys. Uh, so that was definitely doing something uh, cool and different. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit more about how you guys look to innovate. So there's different ways of innovating, obviously, you know, whether it be mechanically, aesthetically, um, you know, I know you guys are a hairspring, hairspring specialist and, you know, you had that paramagnetic hairspring. I be believe it was made out of niobium and titanium. I mean, you can go down to those little intricacies. Where do you, wh what's your process by which you look to innovate? How do you start? Do you do it mechanically and then do it aesthetically? Or, you know, how does it, there's so many elements that come together when designing a watch. How do you go about doing it? Or is it different every time you do a new project we do it naturally <laughs> in a sense that you know there's no i mean we don't have a innovation process and an innovation team uh, as such it's really what i tell my team and i think uh, in, over the years the last seven years we managed to build a team that kind of has this philosophy and this cap capability of picking up on things that they see or they feel or they they, they learn from outside and and say, oh, that's interesting. Could we use that? Or can we do something about it? Or can we, you know, explore that further and then share it with this kind of core team that we have with our head of sales, head of production, my brother, who is also involved in the business. And then we brainstorm and we, we, we try to have regularly those, those kind of meetings where people throw ideas at each other and we actually reward the craziest idea. And, uh, and it can be any, anything. It doesn't have to be product. It can be communication. I think we've been, you were talking about independence. I think we've been very independent in the way we, we communicate, very different from the others. And that's our strength is we don't put ourselves in, we don't give ourselves any boundaries. Um, we know that we sometimes, you know, are walking on a fine line and you might burn your fingers sometimes. But that's the way we need, we, we need to grow and continue to think and, and evolve so that we can surprise people. We can make this industry evolve as well and not being stuck in trying to do the same thing over and over again. We are bored with that. And I think a lot of people out there are bored with that. And that's probably why by, this, by searching for this difference, for this singularity, uh, that helps us stand out so much. 
I'm, I'm curious, based on that, Edward, how you guys actually look at sort of your concept series uh, and how those watches get developed by your team and whether those sort of push the boundaries for your next Pioneer series or for the Venturer series. How does the concept fit into the lineup of, of Moser product? Well, the first concept was actually a simple idea of communication. When, when it was early stage with our Fume dials and I had a lot of times the, the feedback, oh, you make beautiful dials. And I thought, well, let's highlight those dials. So let's create one dial with nothing on it. No logo, no indexes, nothing. And, um, and make pictures. So we created a prototype and I remember my, my the production, uh, the head of production bringing it to me and saying, looks a little bit empty, no? And I was like, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, you, I always think of, um, of you know, when you, you go to a trade show, I like to think that the, the, the watch trade shows should be more like the car shows. If you go to a car show like we have in Geneva, in Frankfurt, probably in the US, you have Detroit or whatever, you go there and people, what they want to see is what they're not going to see in the stores. They want to see the future. They want to see what you're talking about, innovation. But innovation doesn't have to be like this craziest material. It can be, it can be an idea, a philosophy. And, and at that point, for me, Moser was known as the, for this understatement, a little bit of, um, of a Bauhaus approach and a minimalism. And I said, how far can we put the boundaries of that? And I had this watch with nothing on it. And I thought, it's pretty cool. Why don't we create a small series that we present as our concept? But rather than being extremely complicated, it's extremely simple. And that's kind of the highlight of our fair that people will come to see. But we will sell the standard collection. And I want people to come to our booth and say, hey, I want to see that watch. So I printed the 20s or 20 and, and we're going to sell them. And everybody's like, but how do you sell a watch without a logo on it? And they said, well, you know, um, nobody knows Moser anyway. So they're not going to buy it because of the logo. They're going to buy it because <laughs> of the aesthetics, because it's a piece of art. That's quickly changing, Ed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, <laughs> but people are looking, still looking for the watches without the logo on it uh, quite a lot because we limit them so much. And then it was the first idea. And then it was successful. We got amazing people wearing the first batch. And they influenced other people. And then we had to make more. And then we started with series of 10. Then we did 20, then 50. Now we are by series of 100. And they sell extremely quickly. Uh, I'm sure we will talk about the, the, the value of the product, the resale value. But for us, that was very important. And we take decisions thinking, does it bring something to us as a brand? Does, is it building in terms of, of, of the idea? Is, is it like looking into the future? Does it bring value to the, to the brand? Um, or does it communicate a value that is important to us? Some of those concepts, like the, the, the cheese watch that you were, you were uh, referring to, for us, was not about the, the crazy aspect of, oh, it's made of cheese. It was really about us using this as a symbol about what Swiss made should be for us, not for the entire industry, for us. And, uh, and that's how we decided to do it. Same thing with the Swiss Alp watch. When everybody was talking, like uh, approaching the, the big brands about what they think about connected watches, we wanted to be part of it. We wanted to express our idea and rather than being, yeah, you know, is it a threat? We don't know. Maybe we should start to create connected watches. No, we wanted to make a statement and saying, let's, I mean, this is a different category. Let's get inspired, but let's stay true to what we are. We are brands creating amazing traditional watches with traditional craftsmanship with amazing people up here in my manufacturer spending hours uh, doing anglage and assembling uh, movement when we could have robots somewhere doing that in, in, in a matter of seconds. No, it's something very different and we want to continue that. And that was the symbol behind those concepts. Very, very cool. cool. Yeah, I've always said I don't envy the position you're in or any of the other watch manufacturers having to come up with new, you know, interesting things every year. I mean, it's hard to keep uh, consumers interested. It's so and, much fun. You know, wanting to buy more and more. <laughs> um, you know, I, this, I'm lucky. I just get this. That's the best part of the job. It, yeah, it's, it's good. You're embracing it. You know, there you, you go. Like that's it, that's like that's it. awesome. Yeah, you're not built well, for it, to, right? You need you need to be ready to fail though, because that's true. you're never gonna. Work. It's not going to be a, a home run every single time. So yep. sometimes you need to, to take the criticism and, uh, and move on and learn from it. That's great advice. Yeah, if you're, if you're scared to fail, then you'll probably never succeed. So I think the brands uh, but, that are scared to, to fail eventually disappear. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, I, th I thought it was interesting how you said you're, you're not going to appeal to, to everyone. And that's sort of how you build your identity. You know, um, you do your own thing. And hopefully, you know, people appreciate the, the passion that you have for that and, you know, are more inclined to, to want to be a part of it and support it. So in, well, uh, go ahead. 
No, I was saying if you want to, to appeal to everyone, you're going to end up trying to create a, a, a fake Rolex. And frankly, that's not why Moser is there. We want to create right. something that brings something new and different to this market. So this, this is this research for singularity that we are permanently seeking. I was just going to say, there's something, um, you know, one of the words you used is, is identity. And I think it's so easy, uh, at least now for me to identify a Moser, uh, when I see it and there's, there's just a, there's a design ethos, there's an idea there and there's a feeling. Um, and I, I don't quite have words to put to it, but as soon as you see it, you know what it is and you can kind of feel the brand identity coming through it. So, um, you know, I, I know you guys have the tagline of very rare. Um, and, and I think that is very true. I think that comes through very well in your watches. And I, I think the identity that you guys have built um, based on dials with no logo on them, based on dials that do not say Swiss made, I, I think you guys have built uh, an incredible brand identity um, that is resonating more and more with collectors uh, as independents gain, gain more and more traction in the marketplace. Thank you. Yeah, I, I mean, I think when you're building a brand and you want to become identifiable, you you have a watch that people can see across the room and know what it is without seeing the brand name. And I think that Moser is becoming a, a brand like that. I mean, with whether it be the dials or the cases, I, I really mean that. Obviously, it's still very niche even within the watch industry, but those who know can look across the way and say, I think that's a Moser, um, which cannot be said for, for most brands. He was 12. Um, my father had been working for AP for many years and well, they had the, the Royal Oak and we knew how, you know, there was this noble effect and the, he contributed to building this amazing brand. And we took over Moser and I remember a lot of people telling me, you know, this, it could be any brand. And, and, and true. I mean, we, we created slides when we did the due diligence where we had, a, you know, we had a Calatrava, we had a Patrimony, we had a Saxonia, we had a, uh, Jules Audemars and, 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 a, and a Monard at that time from, from Moser, uh, all in white gold with a silver dial and had removed the, the logo and nobody could tell which watch was, was from which brand. And we said, well, that's the problematic. So how do we resolve that? And the first element that we identified was the, uh, the Fumé dial. And that's why we put so much. I mean, it was, uh, I'm not, not saying it was poker because we, we liked those Fumé dial. But for me, it was really as I did the analysis of what we had as assets, um, as features in the product. That was the element that really stand out from stood out, out, stood out from any other brand. And that's why we, we invested so much, not money, but in time in trying to create new colors and new ideas around. And today, well, now with the streamliner, we have a special uh, uh, shape um, of, of case, but today our round watches, because of the Fumé dial, can stand out uh, even meters away across the room. Um, you know, you guys came out with that, you know, talk about a competitive uh, marketplace, you know, stainless steel sports watches, if you will, bracelet watches. And you guys have managed to make a piece that I think is different, stands out. You know, you see the bracelet, you know what it is. And, um, you know, how did the Streamliner and its integrated bracelet open Moser up to a new clientele base? Do you think that people, you know, you talk about how Fume dials seem to be one of the first things that you guys became known for since you took over, you know, less than a decade ago. Now, do you think that, you know, you're seeing more people become interested because of that watch? I mean, we, we decided to develop this line because obviously there was a huge uh, appeal in that segment. And when you look at our brand and how we wanted to evolve, uh, we felt integrated bracelet is something we want to, to, to be able to play with. And uh, there, there were ideas already back in 2012 on my desk when I bought the, the company, but they were too similar to things that existed. So it took us many years to really find something that we felt was sufficiently different, yet very Moser, so we can really move forward with it. And today, what I, what I, I mean, now it's been, what, nine months? maybe less, eight months since we, uh, we launched um, the, the Streamliner Flyback Chronograph Automatic. And what I came to realize is the first people to really love this, this product, well, we knew it wouldn't be an easy piece to understand. I mean, we like complexity. We, we, we think the codes are not something you, you used to or used to anymore. And uh, we felt it would take time for people really to, to understand and appreciate it. Like good, any good thing, if you want to create something iconic, you cannot have love at first sight. For me, it's like music. I like to make the analogy, but if you like music right away, for me, that's pop music. And maybe in three months, you, you completely moved away from that particular song. 
the classics, the things that remain. And for me, it was, I don't know, like when I was a teenager, it was things like Pink Floyd. The first time I heard Pink Floyd, I was like, what the hell is this? <laughs> and today, I mean, I'm, I mean, I, I started listening to Pink Floyd. I can relax in the evening listening to Pink Floyd and stuff like that. But it was not an easy music. All the rest that I listened at that time, I never listened anymore. But for a watch, I think it's, it's very similar. And today, the customers who buy the, the Moser are, are surprisingly different. We have quite a lot who are, were previous Moser owners, but I think the majority were people who, who never looked at Moser before. A lot of people who have been collecting, uh, the, you know, the 5711 or Royal Oak and stuff like that, and eventually want something different and fell in love with that product and love the design and understand those codes and be like, wow, it's different. It's, it's, it's something that really brings emotions to me. and. And that's what we wanted to achieve in a way. We wanted to open new doors and not only uh, always uh, have the same small crowd looking at our products and appreciate them. I mean, these are the big fans and we and we really um, uh, so grateful to those people who are supporting us. And we want to continue to, to, uh, to bring new things. But I think bringing a line like this one helps us look at new horizons. And I think that's, uh, that's amazing how, to see how that changes uh, day by day. And launching a new model uh, tomorrow is, uh, is the ne next step for us. And we're really excited about that. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, I'm, I'm so curious to see where you go with this, this line of watches, actually, with the Streamliner collection. Um, you know, I, I think for me, the Pioneer has a very unique case. It has a very unique shape. Uh, I love it. I, I spent some time with the perpetual calendar. I think that movement is amazing that, um, you know, the days uh, you can quick set dates, uh, it jumps at midnight. I think that that watch is an incredible watch. And I, I'm so curious to see where you go with the Streamliner, especially as a collector, as someone who loves bracelet watches uh, and sort of your, your standards uh, steel bracelet watch is something that I love and appreciate in a collection. And I'm so glad to see you guys add one in there. Um, and I know uh, you guys are going to bring the special Moser magic to it to make it stand out from the rest of the uh, Steel Sports Watch crowd. So I'm I'm very curious to see uh, today's uh, today's or tomorrow's new release and uh, just continue to see where you guys take it. Well, you know, I mean, if the way I like to think is because of our, our small size and if Moser, we have the chance to to be able to offer products at a relatively uh, reasonable price, considering that we are an integrated independent manufacturer. And the reason we are able to do that is because, okay, we have significant volumes in comparison to most independents. We are above 1,500 watches, but that's peanuts compared to the rest of the industry. And at the same time, we have four collections. We have the Heritage Collection, which is more like the inspired by our antique or, or vintage watches. We have the Endeavor, which is the original collection, very classic, elegant. We have the Pioneer, which is our kind of sporty rubber or, or croco um, uh, strap, 120 meter water resistant. And the, the Streamliner, which is more of this iconic uh, polarizing collection. And, and for us, the way we think is these are the four collections and we have about eight movements. So not all movements will be in every single collections, but many of them will be across. So that's the way we can achieve certain volumes. So you were referring to the uh, perpetual calendar, which is from before my time. I contributed it to, to make it reliable, which was the issue before and almost killed H. Moser and company. I think it's the most amazing movement there is in the market. Honestly, I know I'm very objective about that, <laughs> but, uh, but I think it's, uh, it really made me fall in love with, with Moser because it's the most practical movement out there. It gives you the, the, the time, obviously, it gives you the, the, the date, and you don't need to think whether there's 28, 29, 30, or 31 uh, days in the month. It jumps automatically. You can drop the, the, the watch on your desk for, for a month or two and then set it up in 30 seconds max. So it's the perfect perpetual calendar. Now, are we going to put it in the, in the streamliner? Of course. One day there will, it will be in there. When? I don't know. Nice. We need to find something special and make it in that it flows into this, this, um, this collection. But we're already thinking about it. So I, I had that experience with the perpetual calendar. Um, you know, I, I got it and the date was, um, I think it was like four months ahead of where we were, uh, or I guess maybe eight months behind, who knows. Um, but I, uh, I went through and did the, you know, I was like, oh, I wonder how this thing works, going through playing with it. And just the, the there's this component of sort of like this, um, I think every collector has this component of sort of this like rational, um, 
technical know-how of how a watch should work, how the crown should feel, how the engagement should feel. And everyone has their own personal preference around that. But there's this also like irrational, emotional piece that when you get a watch and you have it in hand and you put it on your wrist and you just look at it and go, yeah, I, I love this thing. And I, I can't tell you why, but with the, with the perpetual calendar, I, all I can tell you is when I took it off my wrist and set it, I think it took me the better part of 16 seconds to get it to exactly today's date. And I, you know, just the way the crown moves, the engagement on it, it just evoked this, this feeling of like, oh, this is like, this is quality. This is fantastic. And the fact that it's a perpetual calendar and I don't have to get out a, a pusher and try and figure out how not to scratch the case while resetting uh, dates and moving everything. The fact that it's all done off the ground, just like it, it, it just like brought a smile to my face, Edward. I have, I have no other words for it other than that. It was just this like fantastic experience of getting to play with a watch and, and go like, oh yeah, this is a really cool thing. I, I like this a lot. I think there's, there's an element of the, the, the sound of it. I mean, it's very mechanical and it's yeah. very smooth at the same time. And the fact that you go forward, backwards, never blocks. Um, I mean, uh, it's, it's, it makes me feel good as well. And I think it's a little bit like, you know, in Rolls Royce, when they, 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 there's somebody testing the, the way and the noise that the door makes when you close it, we, where we don't have somebody doing that for our watches, but it's, it's, it's similar. There's this, you know, this mechanical feeling when you, when you play with it and you feel it strong, you feel it's reliable. To be honest, uh, seven years ago, it was not like that. You wouldn't feel the jump of the date. And eventually, they, I mean, sometimes after six months, sometimes never, sometimes after two days, the date would, would block. Well, today, we don't have those cases anymore. But uh, it was a lot of work. Developing a movement, bringing it to a prototype level is the easy part. Making it reliable in significant quantities is the most difficult part. Yeah, absolutely. Did you collaborate with anybody uh, on that perpetual calendar movement? I mean, Danny was raving about how amazing it was, and he's yeah. an incredible identifier of, you know, uh, future brands, I would say, you know, brands that are going to be, you know, in, in high demand, and he is all about Moser, and he was telling me, I remember when he came back, you know, uh, speaking faster than he can think, as he uh, oftentimes does, That's saying, uh, you know, this this perpetual calendar movement, you got to talk to them, you got to find out, he, they had some of the best watchmakers in the world, you know, uh, work on this with them, and it's a good segue because what something I wanted to, to talk about was collaboration and something that I think you guys really got on the map even more in early June when you came out with those collaborative limited editions with uh, MBNF. And, you know, speak a little bit more about what your plans are for the future with, with regards to doing collaborative work. I would love to see more collaboration in the industry. I think that consumers would absolutely love it. I mean, they, they ate it up uh, when, when you guys did your, your two pieces, which I believe sold out very quickly uh, with, with MBNF. Uh, talk a little bit about that, you know, what kind of collaborative work you guys do, whether it be a co-branded piece or whether it be developing a new perpetual calendar movement like the one we were just talking about. I mean, I, I think collaboration is something that we don't do enough in general. And that was a big theme for us. And that's why we made this collaboration this year. And I think launching it during the COVID where everybody was blocked and trying to find solution, I think was very symbolic. I mean, it really came in, in a way at a good time to show, you know, what we could do better in our industry. The collaboration with MBNF goes back about 10 years. Uh, we started working with them, providing and supplying them, developing for them uh, hairsprings and escapements. And escapements are a big part of what they do. I mean, they're beautiful movement where you really see, like in the legacy machines, you see the, the escapement floating on top of the, on the of the watch, and you have the cylindrical tourbillon that we uh, we help develop as well. Um, it's all those elements. So we've been working together for many years, and um, like in many cases in this industry, a lot of people collaborate, but they don't say so. They rather say we do everything in house. Well, at H. Moser, you know, being with Andrea Streller that we developed the uh, perpetual calendar with, uh, with Agenor where we developed the flyback chronograph with, uh, or in this case uh, with MBNF, we like to be transparent. I think there's nothing to hide. At the end of the day, you like a product, you, are, you like the engineering behind it, you like the finishing, you like the, the people behind, or you don't. But it's, I think there's nothing worse than trying to hide the, the reality. And I, I see so many brands, because we are insiders, trying to, to find a way out not to communicate the collaboration. Well, I felt it was important to express that collaboration is one of the best things out there. 
and we should do more of them. So we decided with Max to do that a collaboration, not only one way, but two ways to show how it could be beneficial to both, both brands. And to be honest, it's incredible. We feel a momentum since, since then that we've never felt before. And I think that uh, they do the same. I think we, the, 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 the message got very positively out there. People got a lot of, um, of uh, affinity for both our brands. The products were amazing and were uh, over, everywhere in the media. Um, and I think it will inspire many other brands. And I really hope so. I think uh, Max is the king of collaboration and it's been also very tra transparent. You know, it's uh, Max and friends and all those friends are collaborating in a way and it's very tra transparent and putting, putting them uh, forward. And we were very excited to be, uh, to be part of it. And I think for us at the same time, we are already discussing many potential future collaborations with watchmakers, but also outside of the watch industry. Because once you have set the bar, and I think the bar is quite high with what we did with, uh, with MBNF, we, we don't want to reproduce the exact same thing with somebody else. We want to do something better or different. And, um, and that's the challenge today is find the right collaboration, with, which is something that people will not expect, like this one. People were like, oh my God, I would have never expected it. And some people were like, oh, my two favorite brands coming together. This is like a dream come true. Uh, so we need to find something crazy. And uh, to be honest, we, are, we don't have the solution yet, but we have a lot of ideas. That's, uh, that's awesome to hear. Um, I, I think your collaboration with MBNF, like uh, as, as a fan of both brands, it really um, it gave me a lot of excitement. Um, I think like you mentioned, uh, launching that collaboration during the global pandemic um, gave, you know, watch nerds like myself something to really look forward to and something to be hopeful about and something to be excited about. Um, and, and so uh, I, I think you guys did something really special there. And I think you're onto something really special with this collaborations um, piece of the business. Because for, for me, uh, amongst my friends, they know kind of a lot of people know me uh, for MBNF. Um, and uh, a, a bunch of people reached out to me and said, what do you think about the MBNF HMOJ collaboration? And, and I just think it was probably the best thing um, that, that could have come together at the time for me. Um, and I think it brought so much, so many people to the brand who maybe otherwise wouldn't have thought about it or thought about HMOJ in the same category as an MBNF. Um, and, and I think that is incredibly cool that you guys are willing to look at different collaborations and really bring people in. And I'm really excited to see what you do actually outside of the watch industry. Uh, Cause I think there's so many cool things that I could think of off the top of my head that could be done. Um, and I'm excited to see where you guys go with this. Well, please share yeah. those ideas. I'm looking forward. All right, perfect. We'll have a, we'll have another call to uh, go through. All. <laughs> yeah, I'm getting super excited uh, during this conversation as well you know collaborative work both in the industry outside of the industry ed said you know we got a perpetual calendar coming in the streamliner at some point so uh you know exciting not things too early, to... as it's, it's <laughs> right yeah no the timing's got to be right it has to happen naturally as you said earlier yeah. you know that that's how you innovate and do new things um so obviously you know the coronavirus has, has changed the the world at large so certainly the the, the watch industry very much so as somebody who runs a, a brand how have you had to adapt and what do you think are the brands are going to have to do differently moving forward, you know, to, to connect further with their collector base and, um, you know, sell watches, which is what you guys, you know, need to do in order to, to be successful. Well, I think you, I mean, we've been very lucky to be honest, uh, this year because of those amazing launches, we had the streamliner chronograph, the collaboration piece with MBNF. So far we had an amazing year and I know it's, it's not nice to say that because this industry is in real trouble at the moment. I, I'm, I'm visiting my suppliers on a regular basis because many are on the verge of bankruptcy at the moment. So there's, very, there's a lot of big problems uh, happening. But at the same time, we, uh, we've been quite lucky. And, and to be honest, I think we, 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 we have been facing, um, should I say, uh, challenges for years. So we're used to it. Whereas big brands are not used to it and they're running like chickens without heads at the moment because they don't know what to do. <laughs> we know our customers. We've been connected to our customers for, for, for years. When, so when people said you need to engage your customers, I think we've been engaging them a lot. I mean, I answer messages on so many different platforms, try to, to resolve issues that we could have because as you know, nothing is always perfect. I mean, the mechanical watch can, can, can stop working at some point and somebody can be pissed off and write so. 
uh, and then we need to be there for them to uh, to find solutions but at the same time to to tease them when something new is coming to present something new to them um, so we are out there and we've been there uh, for, for many years so a lot of people saying so are you engaging your customers more than before now I said no we've been doing that for forever uh, we're trying really to be as close as possible and we have the chance because we have a human size company we are we are able to do that um, I have a great team where we, we call ourselves the concierge service. Actually, the concierge service is, uh, is myself, is my brother, is uh, Nicholas, our head of sales, is Olivier, one of the watchmakers. That's the concierge service. We call it the concierge service, but it's just us. And people, I think, appreciate that they have people trustworthy that can take quickly decisions uh, behind the, the, any message they would send to the, to the brand. Sometimes they don't realize they're talking to me or to, to my brother. But um, but I think eventually they realize they are these the, whoever has answered can take decisions and I think uh, we build the trust we build the confidence and um, and that's helped us a lot in the in the in the last uh, few months and years and we continue to do that we try to be even better we're developing a new uh, website today where people will be able to uh, to chat with us live not with a robot or whatever but really ask a question and we'll be there to answer right away um, we have. Uh, many different possibilities to, to talk to people but yes i think this digital um, mutation we started it many years ago many are trying to catch up now but that, that has been the golden years for independent brands who managed to capture this opportunity absolutely and i, I was just going to ask how how big of an influence uh social media the rise of sort of like globally connected technologies whatsapp TikToks, how those have sort of influenced you uh, and, and helped you kind of grow the brand and build a global presence. Um, and just from the sort of collector side, being able to speak directly to the president of a brand. And I, I think so many collectors are gravitating towards independence because they can actually have a human connection to the brand. Um, you know, you could send an email off to, um, you know, uh, info at H Moser uh, and get an email back from you or one of the four people on your concierge service team. And, and you really have the opportunity to speak with a real human, talk to them perhaps about what you have in your collection and identify what piece from that brand most resonates with you and what's going to work best for your, you know, fit in most well with your collection. Um, and, and I just think that that human element is something that's irreplaceable and something that independents have going for them that um, you know, big brands can't actually claim at this point, especially as you know, uh, stores are closed or um, you know, very slow to reopen at this point. Human connection. I mean, <clears throat> we're talking. We, we're selling products that nobody needs. We're selling <laughs> at the end of the day. We're selling emotions. We're selling things that are you know beyond the actual watch. And I think it's for me a big element, as you said, is the human factor. And and probably that's why we use humor. I mean, for me, humor is very human, and that's why we use that as part of our communication. It's it's just the way we are. We have a lot of people who, who um, here who love the Monty Pythons and stuff like that. So when we think let's do a movie, we don't want to do something boring that talks 15 minutes about the history of Mozart. We would get bored with that. With that, so we decide to do things that makes the click to us. And what's fun is we realize that well, the the community of people who will start to appreciate Mozart are people like us and i have so many friends now around the world that are that got connected with us and with each other thanks to the to uh, to h moser back in 2012 i think the the average age of moser owners were above 60 and today we have tons of people that are in their twen late 20s 30s 40s and that's that's awesome because at the end of the day i want to create watches that i can wear them i'm super happy to to wear and show my friends and and continue to create not always thinking uh, oh you know i need to create for uh, a gentleman living uh, in that country who has so much income, blah, 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 blah. No, I want to create a watch that I love and I can wear myself. And, and that's that's why it's so much fun. I mean, George was saying, you know, it must be difficult to find something new all the time. At the end of the day, uh, you know, I mean, I, my, my taste change, my, my brothers, my Nicholas, whoever, they, their taste change as well. So we are constantly trying to uh, to have new ideas and it comes naturally. Yeah, consumers are without a doubt drawn to that connectivity that you provide and being open and the human element. And, you know, we see it firsthand every day that a lot of the group brands now are, are stale or certainly not doing as well as they have in years past. And I think that 
independents are unquestionably taking market share because consumers feel closer to the brand. They can feel the energy, the passion, and the love that you have for what you're doing. And they're drawn to that. And they want to put their resources towards that and be a part of that. And, the, and I think a very, very important element, I think, is also the quantity, the rarity. And for yes. Maybe it uh, helps jump to, a, to another topic. But for me, when you are a collector, a true collector, and you have, you know, you have, you have the, 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 those key watches, you know, the, the Royal Oak, the Nautilus, maybe a Pepsi, a Daytona, there's tons of big brands in the middle where everything is available, has been available, and will be available again. So are you interested in that? No. I think that's why a lot of those people jump then to independence, because having one of those watches is not always easy. I mean, more, many of our of, of the things we produce, many of the things MBNF produce or Grunefeld or whoever get sold out very quickly. So there's this kind of special emotion that you get by having people creating things um, that, are, that is true luxury because true luxury shouldn't be available to everyone everywhere. Uh, and that's the best way for us also to protect the value of what we do. It's our responsibility is to, um, to create products, of course, and make money out of it, which has not been the case all the time. And, and despite continue to create and innovate and invest, and to create things that people are very proud to buy, but also retain value. Without a doubt, scarcity is luxury, that's for sure. Uh, how, how much attention do you pay towards the secondary market? Because um, we've seen, you know, secondary market values do help primary sales. Uh, I think yeah. that you would agree with that. And I, I think Moser is definitely doing better and better uh, on the secondary market. You know, what what are your goals, you know, in order to protect that so that c consumers are more confident putting their money into the product? Well, my, my, my objective, what I tell my team is really, uh, I want the, the models of watches in the future to retain full value or even increase in value. I think that's, that's the objective we have. Um, we're getting there slowly, especially on the new products. There's very few uh, things that we created in the last five years that is on the secondary market. Uh, we monitor it every day. Uh, to be honest, um, we have a long history. I mean, Moser is uh, you know 190 years old, so we have a lot of antique watches. Uh, we have also watches from before my my time, which were produced in, in certain quantities and sometimes sold at a much lower price than they that we do t uh, today. And therefore, uh, we see it at the lower price in the secondary market. But I think that's something that is slowly changing. And I think in the near future, we'll we'll continue to see the uh, evolution positively on the on the on the resale value and. Again, I, I consider myself a little bit as an investment investment banker where people have put their money and invested into our products. And it's not shares, it's watches. It's the same. We need to make sure that we keep, we protect the value of those investments. Uh, it's, it's money and it's trust. And I think we, it's our responsibility, my responsibility and my team's responsibility to protect that value. It's great to hear that. Yeah. So t two more questions for you uh, before before we sign off here. Here's an interesting one. If you could pick the brain of anyone in the greater watch industry, who would it be? I think somebody like Jean-Claude Biver is probably a classic. Everybody refers to him, but still, he's a legend. His craziest ideas. Uh, he has changed. He's turned he has a little bit so of passion brands. too. A little bit. Just, just a teeny bit. <laughs> you can talk about it. <laughs> and uh, and to be honest, I mean, many of the crazy ideas we had and that were so successful were things where I asked myself, what would Jean-Claude Biver do? And uh, and then those crazy ideas came. I remember the first one was when uh, I was driving back when the Swiss franc, the, the Swiss national bank, unpacked the Swiss franc to the um, to the to the euro, and suddenly uh, all our products were getting so expensive, and our margin was down. And then I was just the middle of the restructuring, and I was like, "How are we going to survive this? Because we're losing money. We were losing tons of money. We're slowly getting better, and now this is happening." And everybody, I could hear like, you know, the big bosses of big companies that have cash, cash risks, complaining that this would uh, impact the results of the year. And I was like, oh, sorry, well, I said, why don't we talk? <laughs> it's emotional, you know? I said, why do we talk about those people who anyway have enough money to go through it and not about small independent entrepreneurs who might disappear? How do you, how, why? It got me so pissed off. And I was like, if Jean-Claude Biver was, I don't know, 20 years younger or 30 years younger in my shoes, what do we have done? And we said, it would have addressed the issue. It would have contacted those people. And I wrote, I remember stopping on the side of the highway and, and writing this letter to the Swiss, the president of the Swiss National Bank, 
and sending it to him and to the to uh, some media and then going to bed and then the next morning people from all over the world was contacting us and then suddenly Moser was out there and I was like wow actually we have a share of words you know we can we can speak people listen to us if we have something to say uh, and I think that gives me personally a lot of self confidence and and also my team that we're not anymore like oh so we're almost you know, are we sorry being there as a small independent brand? No, we contribute to this industry as much, if not more, as many of those big, in, uh, big established brands. And that was a turning point for me. Yeah, I'm right. Good for you. <laughs> I'm sorry yeah, for you my guys. language. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I, I love that story. I feel like it just, it, it shows everything about what like an independent watch <laughs> brand can be and can do. And and you're absolutely right. You have an absolutely valid point, a different outlook, and you probably do more than a lot of group brands to actually protect the industry, your suppliers, uh, and to actually drive drive the industry forward. Uh, and so, I, you know, um, as a collector, I, I love hearing that you're looking at uh, your brand as sort of an investment banker, uh, and that you are really paying attention to not only your customers, but you're paying attention to the industry and the world around you and all the factors that are influencing what you do. Um, because I, I, you know, when I'm, when I'm looking at a watch, I want to know that there is, um, you know, that there is value behind it, that there is someone who's going to stand behind it and stand up. And, you know, if the time comes that something goes wrong with the watch, I want to know that I can get concierge services on the phone and talk to you guys and actually not, you know, not be angry about it, but say, Hey, here's what happened. You know, what's the, how do we get this fixed or how do we, how do we move forward here? Um, and I love that you guys are there and that you, you have ideas, you have opinions, and you're not afraid to share them with, with the world and, you know, anyone who wants to hear them. And I think that's, that's one of the best parts about independent brands is that they bring a different opinion. You can have your, uh, said final and intellectual independence, and you can actually take a stand and, and drive, drive it forward. Um, and I, I think that's something that makes independent watches just truly, truly unique in this world. Yeah, it's very comforting that you can reach out to somebody at any time for sure and know that you're going to get a response in a in a timely manner. I think that that's, you know, of the utmost importance. So, Ed, one more uh, question for you before we sign off. Where do you hope to see Moser ideally in the next three to five years? Well, you know, for me, I, I think if we continue to establish ourselves as, as what, what we're trying to do, I want to be the bridge between modern and traditional watchmaking. I think that's what we've done well in the last years. We're trying to do very classic, elegant, beautiful watches. I mean, not UFO, as much respect I have for the Overk and MBNF and what they do. Uh, I think there's a lot of inspiration there for, for us, but I want to be the bridge between the very traditional brand and those brands. And I think that's where we are. That's our sweet spot at the moment. And then we'll continue to do that. So we need to continue to innovate, staying true to traditional watchmaking increase a little bit the volumes while protecting the value. Why do we want to in, uh, continue to increase volumes? Because we can uh, continue to offer better, um, uh, good value for money for our customers. Uh, um, we can continue to invest in innovation and we can protect our, our network because we are under pressure constantly on of big groups trying to get more exposure and more space in, in the retail. And, um, and I think uh, uh, it's important for us to have enough power to um, to fight against uh, the pressure that we get from from those big uh, bigger brands, but uh, you know, with the the evolution and the surge of, of online uh, platforms such as Watchbox, there we are much more on par. I think that's where the, the, this this uh, you know the, the size matters much less, and I think that's a huge opportunity for us. And uh, yeah, we're looking forward for collaborations with brands, but also with platforms like like yours. And thank you for. The continuous support guys thank you should uh, I so much show for... my watch or not George, yes I, yes I, of I course yes my watch? please yes yes yeah, i was so wondering if the, you uh, do that or not i didn't want to pry too much <clears throat> so that's the uh the the, the the streamliner um that we're launching on the on the 20 green dial of august green dial that's it's called awesome. the matrix green it's a 40 millimeter uh 9.9 .9 millimeter um height uh featuring our uh, automatic movement so beautiful with the I have the chrono next to it the chrono was a 40 42.3 so uh, slightly bigger with the bull head I don't show you this one because that's a prototype coming mm -hmm. but uh, for <laughs> oh, wow. next year 
<laughs> There's always <laughs> nice. something, you know. Right, right. So yeah, yeah. very exciting. Um, it's not limited, but it's limited production. So there's not going to be many. Uh, the bracelet is is amazing, very smooth. Uh, I love that design. And many What's people. What's the price who, point um, on it? In U.S. dollars, twenty thousand nine hundred. And is the bracelet and... interchangeable to other watches within the collection, or is it specific to the Streamliner? It's specific to the Streamliner. It's uh, it's important to me when we design. There's always this idea about modularity. I think modularity doesn't belong to luxury, but that's very personal. So I had a lot of people saying, "Oh, you need these intentional interchangeable stra straps on an integrated bracelet." Well, that's the way we design the Streamliner. So maybe one day there'll be a version with another bracelet. But for me, this is the design. This is what we're selling. This is what I love. And uh, if you don't like it, there's tons of other brands out there. <laughs> I love it. I think you're doing a lot of things right, my friend. I love that you're going to stick to your identity and realize you're not going to be for everyone. Your lineup is getting more and more diverse. I mean, having the streamliner, the venturer, the uh, pioneer, all the different, you know, your, your different uh, limited editions that you do, which are all over the place. Um, you know, it's awesome. I really like to see, you know, it's a, it's a breath of fresh air uh, seeing what you guys are doing, you know, uh, while um, most brands are just uh, staying the course and, and doing, you know, the, the status quo. So, uh, you know, keep it going. Love to see w what you guys are doing. And, uh, you know, I, I have no doubt that the, the best is yet to come. Thank you. Todd, thanks for coming on as always. Thank you, guys. Really appreciate it. This has been really fun. And Edward, looking forward to chatting about uh, different collaborations that you guys might do in the future. Definitely. Definitely. We're looking forward. We need ideas. And we need good ideas. So you're more than welcome. Thanks, guys. Absolutely. Take care. Georgia, thanks.